A person probing the universe he lives in will encounter 250 billion galaxies, each the home of about 300 billion stars. Every one of these magnificent systems operates in accordance with specific laws and in a particular order. There is a plan, a design, and a balance in every part of the universe. The Earth occupies a minuscule part of this vast universe, and it too has a perfectly designed system incorporating extremely complex and delicate balances. Unlike any other known heavenly body, its atmosphere and its surface support life. Water, which covers the biggest part of the Earth's surface, is one of the basic elements of life. temperature range, orbital properties, and surface of the Earth all demonstrate that this planet is specifically designed for life. This unique planet of ours is the home of an incredibly complex and comprehensive vitality. Millions of different plant and animal species live on Earth in perfect harmony. This harmony is so perfectly established that it is capable of surviving intact unless deliberately intervened in by human beings. But how did these systems and living things originate? When living things on Earth are examined, a manifest design is to be observed. Every living thing is furnished with extremely complex systems that enable it to play its role in the overall system to the best of its ability. Since life is planned, designed, and organized, it certainly must have a creator. And that creator has been introducing himself to mankind since the beginnings of the world. He is Allah, the one and only God who created the heavens and the earth from nothing and who fashioned everything therein. The theory of evolution that was advanced in the 19th century denies this evident fact of creation. This theory holds that the species on Earth were not created by God, but came into being as a result of processes governed entirely by chance. The founder of this theory was an amateur naturalist named Charles Darwin. Darwin expounded this theory in his book, The Origin of Species, which was published in 1859. Darwin's book was an instant success, but its popularity was due more to the ideological implications of the book rather than its scientific worth. Darwin's ideas provided considerable support for the materialistic philosophy which denied the existence of God. The founder of dialectical materialism, Karl Marx, dedicated his book Das Kapital to Darwin and wrote on the cover, To Charles Darwin, from a devoted admirer.
Darwin's theory argued that all species descended from a common ancestor by means of little cumulative changes in long periods of time. Darwin could advance no sound evidence to prove this claim. Indeed, he was himself aware of the great many facts that invalidated his theory. He admitted these in his book in a chapter entitled, Difficulties on Theory. Darwin's hope was that these difficulties would be overcome by new scientific discoveries. But in fact, advances in science would refute Darwin's claims one by one. Darwin proposed that all species evolved successively from a common ancestor. But how did that first living thing come into being? Darwin did not address this question at all in his book. He was not even aware that this point was one of the biggest refutations of his theory. The primitive understanding of science in his day assumed that life had a very simple structure. According to a theory called spontaneous generation, which was popular since the medieval age, it was believed that living things could easily arise from non-living matter. It was commonly thought that frogs spontaneously arose from mud and bugs from food leftovers. And some curious experiments were designed to prove these theories. A handful of wheat was left on a rag and mice were expected to arise from the mixture. The maggots on meat were also taken as evidence that life could generate from non-living matter. But later it was understood that such maggots did not form spontaneously, but that they emerged from microscopic larvae deposited on the meat by flies. And in Darwin's time, the belief that microbes could emanate easily from non-living materials was very common. But five years after the publication of The Origin of Species, the famous French biologist Louis Pasteur scientifically refuted these myths that lay ground for evolution. Pasteur, after lengthy studies and experiments, reached this very important conclusion. Can matter organize itself? No. Today there is no circumstance known under which one could affirm that microscopic beings have come into the world without parents resembling themselves. The first evolutionist to take up the issue of the origin of life in the 20th century was the Russian biologist Alexander Oparin. His aim was to explain how the first living cell, the alleged common ancestor of all living beings according to the theory of evolution, could emerge. In the 1930s, Oparin formulated a number of theories to show how the first living cell could arise from inanimate matter by chance. However, his efforts ended in failure, and Oparin himself had to confess. Unfortunately, the origin of the cell remains a question that is actually the murkiest aspect of the whole theory of evolution. Evolutionists that followed Oparin conducted experiments to find an evolutionist explanation to the origin of life. The most famous of these experiments was conducted by the American chemist Stanley Miller in 1953. Miller obtained a few simple organic molecules by triggering a reaction among gases that he claimed would have been present in the primitive Earth atmosphere. At the time, this experiment was regarded as a scientific proof for evolution. It turned out to be no such thing at all. 